and welcome to another QHY information video. In this video, we'll look at the similarities and differences of two popular QHY monochrome cameras, the QHY 163M and QHY 183M. And while the focus is on the monochrome models, be aware that both of these cameras also come in single shot color versions as well. First, let's take a look at some of the features that these two models share. The first obvious similarity is that the two models share the same camera body and have the same connectors on the rear panel. The medium sized cold moss camera body is 77 millimeters in diameter and 81 millimeters long. With the T-thread dovetail adapter attached to the front, the total length is about 92 millimeters. The sensor is mounted close to the front with a C-mount compatible back focus distance, about 17 millimeters behind the front of the dovetail T-thread adapter. All of the electrical connectors are located on the rear panel of the camera body. The USB connector is a 3.0 type B connector for making a secure connection that won't accidentally pull apart under normal use. The camera is supplied with a heavy duty USB 3.0 cable. Most QHY cameras can also be used as guiders, including the 163 and 183 models. The opto isolated guiding port is a standard ST4 configuration using an RJ11 style jack. The guiding cable is included with each camera. For filter wheel control, a custom QHY 4-pin filter wheel port is included that provides power and control signals for QHY dual control filter wheels, like the Series 3 filter wheels. Both the Series 2 and new Series 3 filter wheels can be controlled by either an independent external program using the filter wheels USB port or via the QHY 4-pin serial port. When connected to the QHY 4-pin port, there's no need for an additional power cable or control program. All of the filter wheel functions are controlled through the camera and its operating software. The new CFW3 series filter wheels are available in four sizes to accommodate filters from inch and a quarter to 50 millimeters square. The smallest CFW3 has a seven position carousel that will accept both inch and a quarter filters in threaded cells and 31 millimeter unmounted filters. Inch and a quarter filters are fine for the 183 camera, but the larger 163 requires 31 millimeter filters or larger to avoid vignetting. The Series 3 filter wheels utilize a new motor with direct drive and will reverse direction to take the shortest path when moving from one filter to another. For example, in this demonstration, the wheel moves from filter position 1 to position 2 to position 3 and then back to 1 again, over to position 7 and back to position 1 without ever making a complete rotation of the carousel. This saves time if you're doing a lot of filter changes in one imaging session. You may also notice that the LED changes color for each filter position. The tri-color LED assigns one unique color or combination of colors to each filter position so you can tell if it's moved to the correct position without removing it from the telescope. The CFW3 is also thin. This feature and the short back focus of the cold moss cameras means you can add one of several camera lens adapters for Canon and Nikon camera lenses for wide field imaging with the filter wheel. In the center of the back plate is a 12 volt BC power port. This port's threaded for a short extension cable that's supplied with the camera that securely attaches such that it will not accidentally disconnect while you're imaging. Finally, both models have two stage thermal electric cooling of the sensor to about minus 40 degrees C below ambient for maximum reduction of dark current noise in long exposures. Unlike consumer cameras, the sensor in a dedicated astro camera is installed in a sealed chamber. When the sensor is cooled, steps must be taken to avoid dew or frost on the chamber window or on the sensor. Dew is moisture that condenses from the air onto the outside of the chamber window. Frost is water vapor that freezes when it comes into contact with the inside of the chamber window or the surface of the sensor. 
QHY has more than 10 years of experience designing cool cameras, and these models benefit from those years of anti-dew and anti-frost design experience. To help prevent dew from forming on the chamber window, heating elements are built into the light shield just above the chamber. To avoid frost from forming inside the chamber, a desiccant tube is provided that can easily be attached by the user to the outside of the camera when needed to dry the internal atmosphere of the chamber and remove any built-up moisture. Now we'll examine some of the differences between the two models. If we look at the front windows side by side, we can see that the Panasonic sensor in the 163 camera is larger than the Sony sensor in the 183 camera. In fact, it's almost exactly twice the area of the Sony sensor. This means it will have a larger field of view on a given telescope. However, even though the Sony sensor is smaller, you will notice from the camera specs that the Sony is a 20 megapixel sensor, whereas the Panasonic sensor is 16 megapixels. So the Sony part will have somewhat higher resolution on an optical system that's not already limited by its size and the seeing conditions. Another visual clue to the differences in these sensors is the way they reflect light when you look at them. The Sony sensor appears quite dark. This is because the Sony part is a back illuminated sensor with little reflection from its surface. In a typical front illuminated sensor, photons from the target entering the photosensitive layer of the sensor must first pass through the metal wiring that's embedded just above the photosensitive layer. The wiring structure reflects some of the photons and reduces the efficiency of the sensor. In a back illuminated sensor, the light is allowed to enter the photosensitive surface from the reverse side. In this case, the sensor's embedded wiring structure is below the photosensitive layer. As a result, more photons strike the photosensitive layer and more electrons are generated and captured in the pixel well. This ratio of photon to electron production is called quantum efficiency. The higher the quantum efficiency, the more efficient the sensor is at converting photons to electrons and hence, the more sensitive it is to capturing an image of something dim. We can see this effect when we compare the QE charts from the two cameras. The 163 has an estimated peak QE of about 60%. The 183 has a peak closer to 85%. In the near IR, they're about the same, but in the visual range, the QHY183 QE is quite a bit higher, about twice the QE in the blue, and significantly higher at the double oxygen lines near 500 nanometers. Both cameras are very respectable near the important H-alpha line. The remaining specifications are more alike than different, but for the sake of completion, we'll mention the primary specs of dark current, read noise, full well capacity, dynamic range, and frame rates. Dark current is the accumulation of electrons generated in the sensor itself rather than from conversion of photons. Dark current is also a source of noise in a long exposure. Fortunately, dark current and its associated noise can be reduced dramatically by cooling the sensor. The Sony sensors are well known for their low dark current, and it has about half of the dark current of the Panasonic sensor. But both are very low, and when cooled to about minus 15 C, both sensors have dark current of less than 1 100th of an electron. This is extremely low and facilitates long exposures without significant contribution from dark current noise. Read noise, full well capacity, and dynamic range all vary according to the gain setting. Increasing the gain results in lower read noise and lower full well capacity. These two parameters then work together to yield the range of useful charge that can be used to create an image, or the dynamic range. Since read noise is variable, the best way to compare the two cameras is to look at the read noise curves at lowest gain, at unity gain, and at high gain. Unity gain is where the system gain is equal to 1. 
If we do this, we see the read noise of the two cameras are very similar. At high gain, they achieve single electron noise figures. And at lowest gain, where the read noise is the greatest, they both still have read noise of less than three and a half electrons. At unity gain, they're almost the same with read noise around 1.6 to 1.7 electrons. Full well capacity also varies according to the gain setting. And again, the cameras are more alike than different. Since the read noise decreases along with the full well, the resulting dynamic range tends to have a flatter curve. The two models have very similar characteristics. As expected, the 163 with its larger pixels has a slightly greater full well capacity at lowest gain, about 19 and a half thousand electrons. At unity gain, however, both cameras have similar full well capacities of just over 4,000 electrons. The resulting dynamic range for both cameras varies from a maximum of about 12 and a half stops at lowest gain to about 11 and a half stops at unity gain and about seven to eight stops at high gain. Finally, both cameras have similar frame rates and make excellent planetary imagers. The frame rate increases as smaller regions of interest are selected. The 20 megapixel 183 has 25% more pixels to transfer than the 163, so its full frame rate is slightly slower. However, if we look at the 4K HD frame rate for both cameras, they're nearly identical at 30 frames per second. At 1920 by 1080 HD resolution, they are both about 60 frames per second, and at 800 by 600, both produce 100 frames per second or more. To summarize then, these cameras both exhibit excellent sensitivity and low noise, with the back illuminated 183 having higher sensitivity and somewhat higher resolution, and the 163 with its 4 thirds inch sensor having about twice the field of view. Both are well suited to planetary and deep space imaging, particularly when mated with the CFW3 filter wheel. The 183 with its smaller, higher resolution sensor is a good match to short focal length telescopes or for imaging smaller dim objects through a large scope. The larger 163 gives a greater field of view and would be a good choice for imaging larger areas of the sky, such as nebula, or when coupled to a longer focal length telescope to take greater advantage of the scope's full field. Seen here is a cold mass camera coupled to a Rasa 8 inch F2 scope with Water Planetarium's new custom filter changer and camera tilter adapter made especially for QHY cameras. This adapter not only has a filter slider that does not vignette the optics, but any tilt of the camera can be adjusted without removing the camera from the scope. The following 180 minute image was taken with this system. The large aperture and fast focal ratio resulted in an image comparable to many hours of exposure through an F4 system or slower. The QHY 163M has a retail price of $1199, and the QHY 183M is $999. In single shot color, the 163C is $899, and the 183C is only $699. These two models also come bundled with the new CFW3 filter wheel. The 183M and CFW3S SR7 seven position inch and a quarter wheel, normally 1278 if purchased separately, is 1199. The 163M and medium size CFW3M US7 seven position 36 millimeter filter wheel, 
Normally, $15.48, if purchased separately, is $13.99.